We are in Mark chapter 10 this morning. We have been navigating through a series on the life of Jesus and who was this? Uh, Was he more than just a great teacher, more than just a a prophet, more than just a miracle worker? And the answer to all of those is yes, he is God in the flesh. We've been navigating through this this series. So we are in the book of Mark and we are going to be looking at Mark chapter 17, or excuse me, Mark chapter 10, verse 17 this morning. And, And let me just set the stage of what we're going to be walking through today. Jesus has, has been performing miracles. He's been doing some incredible teaching. Last week, we, we had this moment where Jesus gives one of the, the most difficult teachings, uh, particularly on marriage. Uh, and if you were here last week, we, we, we navigated through that and talked about the seriousness of marriage and what Jesus and the Bible clearly teach about divorce. And then he had this moment where he was blessing the little children. And, and the disciples came and said, knock it off. Get away from him. Jesus got better things to do with his time. And he pauses there, and he gets actually a little frustrated with his disciples, and he said, let the little children come to me, places his hands on them, prays with them, blesses them, and and, and we're going to talk about that in just a moment as to why, because it ties back into this story, and in the process of that, as Jesus is on his way, a rich man comes up to him, a very wealthy man comes up to him, and asks this incredibly important question, probably a question that I would imagine everybody in this room has asked ourselves at some point in our life, what do I need to do? to get into heaven? What what do I really need to do? What is it going to take in order for me to get into heaven? And the thing that's fascinating is this guy really, uh, from all purposes, from the world's standpoint, he's got it all. He's got money. He's got wealth. He's a, he's a ruler. As a matter of fact, the, 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 he's, his story is mentioned in the first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And we n- learn from that. One, he's wealthy. Two, he's a young guy. And three, he is a ruler. He's a person with authority. But there's something churning in him that is saying, there's something missing in my life. There's, there's something that I need an answer to, and this Jesus is right here, and I'm going to ask him. And I, I just wonder if maybe there's a few of us here today that are asking ourselves the same questions. We've got everything that the world offers, and yet we know we're missing something deeply important. What does it take to have eternal life with God, to have a relationship with him? And the bigger question, do you really have it? And it's all here in Mark chapter 10. So hopefully you found yourselves there. Mark is the second book of your New Testament. And uh, you can go past the first 39 books of the Old. And then you're going to hit Matthew, Mark, Mark chapter 10, starting at verse 17. And this is what it says. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. Teacher, he declared, all these things I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and he loved him. One thing you lack, he said. Go sell everything you have. And give it to the poor, and then you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. At this, the man's face fell, and he went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, Children, how hard is it to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Then Peter spoke up, we've left everything to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brother or sister or mother or father or children or friends for me in the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, along with persecutions in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. Father, as we embark on your word and your truth this morning... We need your presence. I ask that you would move in a way that only you can. That for some of us, maybe today, the question of how can I inherit eternal life would be answered. And God, that it would be a life-changing moment today. 
For others of us, maybe that decision and that, that understanding is already there, but there are some other things that you want to work in our hearts. You want, to, you want to start fleshing out in our lives, and I pray that we would be open and receptive. So God, give us ears to hear you. Would your words speak powerfully? Would your spirit move in our midst? And would you do a work that only you can? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So if you grew up in church, you've probably heard this story a multitude of times. And I, I, I want to be cautious. Let, let's not get to the spot of, well, this is a story for a rich man who has a ton of money. I don't have a ton of money, so this doesn't apply to me. Would you do me a huge favor and say, this is for you today. Just tell your neighbor that this is for you today. What we are going to talk about is for all of us. It really is. And I want to give us some take-home truths this morning, just three of them. And I promise I'm going to wrap up in the next three and a half hours. So we're going to be really short this morning because we got a second service and we've got uh, the Con Summer Connect coming up. But three takeaway truths. The first is this. If you're asking yourself this question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Here's the truth. We can never earn eternal life. Would you just say that with me? We can never earn eternal life. Now say it like you really believe that. We can never earn earn eternal life. The fundamental problem in his question is this. Did you hear it? Good teacher, he asked, what must what I do to inherit eternal life? Now, could it be that this guy has inherited this great amass of wealth from his parents, from a distant grandma? We, we have no idea where he got all the money and the resources and the possessions that he has. It could be that he was a hard worker, but it could very well be that he inherited it. And that's where the question comes. I inherited all of this. What must I do, good teacher, to inherit eternal life? And it almost seems that Jesus says, you can earn it. He goes, well, you know the commandments, right? Did you catch this? You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony. And I think in our minds, that's what we start to do. If I can just live up to some expectations, because did you catch what the guy says? All of these things I have done since I was a boy. And, and here's the thing, you know, some of us might be thinking, we're pretty good. No, don't raise your hand right now if that's you. <laughs> but some of us get to that spot where we start thinking, you know what, I'm not that bad. They're really bad, but I'm not that bad. My neighbors, they're the worst, right? But I'm not that bad. Go to church, do some things. I'm not that bad. And can, can I pause for just a moment? Because Jesus brings up just the Ten Commandments with this guy. And as a matter of fact, he only brings up five of them. He leaves off coveting. He leaves off coveting at the end because we're going to see in a moment this guy has a little bit of a money problem that happens to be his God. But I just want to walk through the Ten Commandments with us this morning just to see how we're all doing, okay? Can we do that for just a moment? First one, first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. Uh, depending on how you want to translate that and think about that, maybe you're like, oh, man, Jesus, yeah, I'm, I'm doing pretty good in that. Number two. You shall not make for yourselves any graven images and bow down to it. Most of us are like, hey, score, I nailed that one. Haven't been making anything at the woodshop class or anything along those lines. Number three, you shall not misuse the name of God. Uh-oh, we start to get a little bit more serious now. Honor the Sabbath day, and you're going to keep it holy. Have you ever not honored a day of rest before God? Now, some of us are, oh, is that really real, Brian? You know, what are you trying? Okay, now we're going to start hitting into these relational things. See, the first four Ten Commandments are all about our relationship with God. The last six all have to deal with our relationships with other people. Number five, honor your father and your mother. Any of us ever had the eye-rolling moment? Oh, gosh, come on, really? Really, mom and dad? And I'm not even talking about when you were younger. You do it when you're older too, right? They're so embarrassing, right? Whatever it is. How do you talk about them in public? How do you treat them? Ah, oh, number six, you shall not murder. Many of you are like, score, got another one down. Uh, except when Jesus defines murder as if you have hatred in your heart towards somebody, you have committed murder with them in your heart. You're like, mm, man, I'm almost there, right? Number seven, you shall not commit adultery. Shall not commit adultery. And maybe some of us are like, yeah, another. Uh, Jesus says, you look at somebody else lustfully. You've committed adultery with them in your heart. You shall not steal. Anybody ever take something that didn't belong to you? Yeah, me neither. I, I knew you didn't. So <laughs> pack of gum, money sitting on the table, whatever it may be. You get into those places. Number nine, you shall not lie. You shall not bear false testimony. And, and we get into spots where we cut corners on this all the time. Well, I didn't not tell them the truth. 
I, 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 they, they didn't ask the right question, Brian. Have you ever been around people like that? They tell you what you want to hear instead of, well, you didn't ask me the exact right question. We do this stuff all the time. And then the last one, you shall not covet. You shall not cover your neighbor's wife, their car, their home, their donkey, according to the Bible. So uh, maybe you've been doing that, right? So here's the deal. Anybody here perfect on all of those 10? Just 10 of them. So guess what? You're all sinners, would you do me a huge favor and say, welcome to the club? Just say that to me. <laughs> welcome to the club. Every single one of us has broken God's standards. Every single one of us. There are no self-made saints here today. We are all in the same company. And here's the problem, what happens. There's an idea of religion. Religion emphasizes rules. It's what religion does. Religion emphasizes a bunch of rules. We just talked about this. This rich young ruler comes up to Jesus. What can I do? What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, one, why do you call me good? But secondly, you know the commandments. And walks through all the commandments. And listen to what he says. All of these I have kept since I was a boy. This kid was the poster child for religiosity of the day. He grew up in a God-fearing home. He's a guy who is passionate you see him, he runs up, he gets on his knees before Jesus, he's humble, he's obeyed all the commandments, he's doing all the right things. Any of you here grow up in church? Let me show you, see your hands real quick. I'm, I'm not going to call you out, but roughly about half of you guys have grown up in church, maybe even a little bit less than that. I grew up going to church. I went to church, I think I've shared this with you before, I was a drug baby. I got drugged to church on Sunday morning, Sunday nights, and Wednesday evenings, right? My parents drugged me every, I was at church all the time, and it was right up the road, and I had Sunday Sunday school teachers and youth leaders and the pastor, I was getting bombarded. And you know what the similar story was? And it wasn't anybody's fault. You know what, Brian? You know what you need to do? You shouldn't be cussing. You shouldn't be drinking. You shouldn't be chewing. You shouldn't be going with girls who do that stuff either, right? And this whole list of a multitude of things. And if you remember, right, uh, the, the, do you guys remember, were you in the area, the, the, or, excuse me, the era of the egg, and they would crack the egg on TV, and they're like, this is your brain. This is your brain on drugs. And they're like, yeah. Yeah. They're like, you want to cuss? You're going to burn in hell. How would you like that? I'm like, no, I don't want to. Right? And this list of all of these rules that if you just live up to all these rules, if you just do the right things, then you have earned yourself a position with God. And are those things bad? No. They're things that are clearly laid out in Scripture. But the problem is we get to these spots where we think we earn some, something with God, that, that he's lucky to have me on his team. And I'll tell you honestly, I, I call this this performance trap that we get in into our relationship with God, that God loves me a whole lot more when I'm doing all the things that I think that I should be doing. And so I'm driven this way. And what I notice, men in particular, this is how we're wired. Man, if I got to earn God's love, I got to earn salvation, just like this guy. What do I need to do to inherit eternal life? Because I feel like if I just do a little bit more, and the problem is we, we build this morality ladder. I'm going to pick on a couple of people here for a moment. So, Gary, would you do me a favor? You just sit right there, man. You are looking good today, by the way. So give it up for Gary. Gary, Gary. So the, the, here's the morality ladder that we start going with. So, Gary, because I have a good relationship with Gary, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick on you for a moment, Gary. Gary is, let's say, representative. I know this is not the case with him. He's, he's a guy, mora morals, pretty, pretty, pretty subpar, not, not great. So uh, I'm going to pick on somebody else here for a moment. Phil, can I use you? I'm going to have you stand. Phil, just stand up for me. Phil's a guy who, he, he kind of does the right things for the most part. Yeah, does he commit murder? Does he love his, he, he, no, he doesn't commit murder. So uh, he doesn't commit, he loves his wife. He, he's kind of, oh, morally speaking, he's doing pretty good. Walking through the journey, doing a, a pretty good job. Um, can, I, can I get one more? Michael, you're, you're nice and tall. I'm going to actually have you, Michael, join me on stage for a moment. Because Michael is like the superior moral guy, right? So Michael, come on up here. Michael goes to church regularly. He, he, he gives. He serves. He, he he's, it steps above everybody else. He listens to the Sunday messages and says, Brian, fantastic job. I mean, this guy does it all. And everybody looks at him, and, and this is what we end up doing, right? We start comparing ourselves. Oh, that guy over there, that guy over here. And, and if you're not careful, I'm going to speak to some of us who have been a Christian for a long time. We get into Michael's shoes, and then we start looking down on everybody else, thinking, I've achieved something in life. I deserve this in life. Now, the problem is, this is we're, we're great at comparisons. 
Gary and, and Phil, and, and we always go to the person of, well, at least I'm not that bad. Do you want to know why Jerry Springer and all those uh, shows became so popular? Because families went, well, at least we're not that bad, right? That, that's what we do. At least I'm not that bad. The problem is, if the goal was that these guys had to be at the roof, is anybody making it? None of them. And that's just to the roof. What if it was, if these guys were supposed to make it to the sun, is anybody making it? It's not a trick question, guys. This is really not a trick. Is, is anybody making it? No, they're not. And it doesn't matter if you're seated, if you're standing, or if you're up on the platform. We're missing it. Michael, thank you. Phil, you can have a seat. Gary, remain seated. You're doing great. So, uh, <laughs> and we get into these spots where we think if I just live up, and that's what religion does. It's my best effort to try and get to where God is. The problem is I can never do that with my energies and my efforts. I cannot earn my way to getting to a relationship and to eternity with God. I grew up, as I shared with you guys, thinking that, God, if I could just get this, just get And some of us get into spots where we, we don't do certain things, and then we start doing certain things, and we start reading our Bibles. And I'll never forget the day I was sitting reading my Bible and spending time with God, and it dawned on me. Christianity is far less about what I'm not doing and far more about what I am doing and who I am. Let me say that again. Christianity is far less about what I'm not doing than what I am doing and who I am in Christ. Because we can make a bunch of don'ts, and then we think we're living up to some expectation that earns us something. Religion emphasizes rules. Jesus came to do what I could not. Jesus came to do what I could not. So this rich man says, hey, Jesus, I've been following all of those things since I was a boy. I've done it. I've been living it out. I've been doing all the right stuff. He is the poster child, for, and yet he is missing something. And I wonder if maybe for a few of us here today, we keep coming to church, we keep reading our Bibles, we keep praying, we keep going through all the right motions, but deep down there is something that is missing. And then Jesus gives this, this statement, one thing that you still lack, go and sell everything you have and give it to the poor and then come follow me. And this man walks away sad. His face drops this is one of these rare moments. As a matter of fact, I don't think that there's another one according to the Scripture, except maybe if you consider the Pharisees and the religious leaders getting frustrated with Jesus, that Jesus has an encounter with a person and they walk away worse than when they came. He goes, Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, go and give it all. And then he makes this comment, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples are amazed at his words, but Jesus then said again, children, how hard is it to enter the kingdom of God? It's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Now, I don't know about you, but I grew up in church, and somebody told me years ago that at the city, they, they would close all the gates, and that there was this one gate called the eye of a needle. Has anybody ever heard this before? And uh, they would take and have to take all the, the packaging and all the, the baggage off of the camel, and the camel would have to get on its knees and kind of work its way through the gate, and it was this big, can I tell you that's not true? Somebody made all that stuff up. They lied to you too. They lied to me. That's not true. What Jesus is really saying is, Hey, let me, let, me, let me find something here that would make this work for you. Oh, look at that double back camel right there. That big, that's a big camel. And here's a needle. Can you fit that camel through the eye of this needle? No way. It's impossible. As a matter of fact, to be honest, some of you are having a hard time putting thread in an eye of a needle nowadays. <laughs> Anybody here want to admit that? Listen, I'm a fisherman. I'm always trying to thread little things and tie knots, and I'm doing this. I'm in my late 40s right now. I refuse to wear glasses. So I know what Jesus is talking about. Can you imagine fitting a camel through the eye of a needle? And he, what is his point? It is impossible. It's not doable. The rich, even though they and this is what Peter gets. He goes, well, then who on earth can be saved, Jesus? Because here's what was going on back in this time. People thought, if you were rich, you are blessed by God. Man, God's favor is upon your life. Of course he wants you in eternity with him. And Peter's like, who can be saved then? And Jesus says these incredible words. With man, this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. It was the point. 
you and I can never earn a right relationship with God. We can never earn our eternity with God. It'll never happen. And if you remember this, and I just draw your attention to when Jesus was blessing the little children, just a couple of verses up from your page, Jesus says these words, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. And then he says this, truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. Romans says it this way, for the wages of our sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What our sin deserves is eternal separation from God because we've got a gap that we cannot make up. God's salvation, did you catch what it is? It's a gift to be what? Received. And you cannot earn that. And I wonder if some of us, hey, good to see you, Brian. <laughs> I wonder if maybe for some of us we're in a spot of trying to earn, earn our salvation when it's been entirely always the, the point of God that we would receive it. <laughs> I think we get into these spots, right, where we think we're achieving something when in reality what, what God's calling us to do is simply to receive it. So how do we make up that difference if it's whether where Gary is at or where Phil is at or where Michael is at, that gap between us and God, Jesus came to fill that gap for us. That's what he paid for. That's what he came on the cross. That's what we see he's leading up to go to Jerusalem to give his life as a ransom for you and for me. And it's not about earning anything with God. It is simply about receiving God's love and his favor. And that is what I love about Christianity. All the other religions of the world, you know what it is? It's our best efforts to try and get to where God is, which we can't. And Christianity is where God said, you will never get to me, so I'm gonna come to you. I wanna meet you where you're at. And if you have never experienced that, maybe for some of us today, you keep trying to live up to expectations. You keep trying to map this all out, that if I can just do a little bit better, then God will receive me and God will accept me. And I'm just going to tell you this, there is such freedom when you come to the spot where you say, I'm not worthy of receiving anything from you, God, but by faith, I receive what you've done, Jesus, for me on the cross. I receive that. You've forgiven me and you have called me your child that I get the opportunity of spending eternal life with you, not because I'm that good but because, God, you are that good and you paid the price for me and all I can do is receive that. And if you have that today, it's what we celebrated in baptisms. That's what those individuals are declaring. And I, that should give us joy that we don't have to earn something with God. Is that true? Okay, fantastic. <laughs> Point number two, I must choose if Jesus is just good or if he is God. For some of you, you walked in today going, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And the simple answer to that is you can't do anything. You can't earn it. It is simply receiving what Jesus Christ has done for you. But this guy comes up and says, Jesus, he says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus responds to him, why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good but God alone. Romans 3 talks about that. Proverbs talks about that. Solomon wrote about it, that there is no one who does good. Jesus is now declaring. He's not saying that he's not God. As a matter of fact, he's affirming it. He's, what he's saying is, do you really realize what you are saying to me? This rich young ruler comes up to Jesus and says, I know that you are a good teacher. And for some of us here today, the question is this. We love a Jesus who's good to us. Oh, man, Jesus is so good. He forgives my sin. I pray to him and he helps me when times are tough. He's, he's done some great stuff in my family and financially. He got me this job. I really trust Jesus. And I pray and he answers me. And we love a good Jesus. But Jesus didn't come just to be good for you. He came to be God to you. And that's really different. Because we love a Jesus that comes alongside of us and helps us get what we want. We struggle with a Jesus who says, hey, Brian, this is what I want for you today. Will you do it? This is what I'm asking in your life. Will you do that? Does Jesus have the authority in your life? Is he more than just a good teacher? Is he more than just a miracle worker for you that you come to him and say, I, I want this? Or is he really God in your life today? What is the one thing? Jesus says, hey, one thing you still lack. 
Am I God in your life? Go and give everything that you have to the poor and sell it. And then come and follow me. And the man walked away sad because he did want a good Jesus. But he didn't want Jesus to be God. And I share this for some of us because I know there may be a few of us in here, maybe a lot of us, that we go through life's journey, we come to church, we do all the right things, we're going through the right motions. But do we love a good Jesus or are we saying, Jesus, you are God in my life. If you say this, I'm doing it, I'm committing to that, I'm going to follow that, I'm going to trust you in this, I'm allowing you to call the shots in every decision of my life. Tell me what you want me to do, which leads us into the third and final thing, following Jesus will always require me to give something up. If I'm really going to follow Jesus, it will always require me to give something up. Go sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. At that, the man's face fell, and he went away sad because he had great wealth. I know some people will read this and go, man, if you're rich, if you have wealth, God is expecting you to sell it all and you need to give it to the poor. I want to be clear. That's not what the Bible is clearly teaching here. As a matter of fact, this is the only portion of Scripture that you see Jesus command that to that degree. And the reason was is because Jesus wasn't God in his life. Money was God in his life. Possessions were the God of his life. And he calls him to that. There are rich people in the scriptures. Joseph of Arimathea is pretty wealthy. Abraham, a wealthy guy. And you don't see any of them that God says, hey, you need to give it all and give it to the poor. He's just saying this specifically to this guy because he knows. He knows the things in our life. And I wonder if there's something for each and every one of us in here this morning that maybe God is calling you. If you're really going to follow him and say, I'm all in, Jesus. I want to follow you with everything in my life that he's saying. There's something that you've got to give it up. We read this a couple of months ago in Mark chapter 8, verses 34 through 35. Then he called to the crowd. He called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said these words. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. This man missed the opportunity of a lifetime. Anybody ever think, man, if I was back in Jesus' time, how cool would it be to walk with him and see all the miracles and listen to his teaching and follow him? Anybody here thinking, I would love to do that? Anybody? Okay, four of you. All right, I don't know what's going on with the rest of us. But this guy had the opportunity. Jesus lays it out before him. and, And if we're honest, I wonder how many of us miss the opportunity now because Jesus says, hey, am I good Or am I God? And if I'm God, are you willing to let this go to really follow him? And I don't know what that may be for you today. Maybe for some of us it is our wealth. We think it just a little bit more. If I just got a little bit more stuff and man, everything would be great. Maybe maybe for some of us it's control. Anybody love control? You're always in the driver's seat. Anybody married to somebody who loves control? Yeah, we love that. And the bottom line is, is Jesus just going to be good or is he going to be God in our lives? Maybe it's your dream. Well, isn't Jesus about coming alongside of me and helping me fulfill my dream? Can I just tell you something in love? Your dream pales in comparison to the dreams that Jesus has for your life. He can, he, he can do immeasurably more than you think or could ever imagine with your life if you will just trust him. And maybe for you, there's some, there's some things. It's a, it's a different course of your job. It's you've been going to school for this. It's a passion of where you think that you're going to go. Maybe it's a missions trip. Maybe God's calling you into ministry and you go, I don't know if I want to go into ministry. I have no idea what it may be in your life. But will you trust him enough to say, Lord, if this is what you want, I'm going to surrender everything. I'm going to give this up to pursue you because I trust that not only are you good, but you're going to be God in my life. And I'm going to commit myself to you. Maybe for some of us, It's a relationship. It's time to make a decision in a relationship. Maybe it's time to step away from a relationship. And if Jesus is going to be God, you know what that decision is. Maybe it's a change of location. Maybe God wants you to move from I own to Pine Grove, California. You know, I I have no idea. I have no idea. But maybe God's calling you to do that. He did it with Abraham. Maybe he's doing that for you. Maybe it's a different commitment of time with him. I have no idea what it's going to be, but if we're going to follow Christ, let's just be honest, it's going to come with giving something up. 
And so I just want to speak to a handful of us here this morning. One, maybe you're here and you walked into these room, this room going, I, I don't know what it would mean to have eternal life. What do, how do I get it? Maybe the question this morning was answered by simply saying, you can't do anything to earn it. You can never achieve it. It only comes by the grace of God and belief in what Jesus Christ has done for you. He paid the price. And maybe for you today, that is the decision you want to make walking out of this place. For some of us, I, I just want to share this story. I was at uh, Stanislaus State for a couple of years going to school. And as I was there, I was, it was a season of spiritual growth for me. And we had these guys come onto our campus. And they were the typical street preacher sign. You know, they would pull out signs. And they were yelling at everybody walking by. You rock and rollers. You porn, you know, you, you prostitutes. They were saying all sorts of just crazy things to these students. And I remember walking up to one of the guys. And I know I've shared this story before. But I said, hey, uh, what, what are you guys doing here? Well, we're trying to turn people to a relationship with Jesus. I said, I don't think that's happened in my friend. And, and he, he, as we started this conversation, I, one of the, the individual's names was Daniel. I think it was the one that I was talking to. It was a father and son team. And I remember sitting there with Daniel. And I said, Daniel, wh wh what are you doing? And, and these were his words to me. I'll never forget. I said, do you think you're winning people to cry? What's going on here? And he goes, Brian, this, these were his words. I haven't sinned in three years. I was like, wow, that's impressive, man. And he goes, and my pastor hasn't sinned in 13 years. And I thought, wow. And I remember I was probably 20, 21 years of age at the time. I turned to him and I said, so you're telling me that you love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. And you love your neighbor as yourself every moment of every day. <laughs> I'll never forget. He looked at me and went, I haven't thought about it like that, you know, so. <laughs> and here's what I want to cautious us with. For those of you who have received eternal life, I think the further we get away from that moment, we start to get a little bit like Michael up here. Where we start to view people as underneath us, that we're better, that they're not as good, that God's lucky to have me on his team spending eternity with him forever that he scored with me, and that somehow, yeah, I don't really sin. Jesus gave me a great kickstart, but I don't know. I'm pretty close to perfection. And can I just tell you something in love? We're not. May we always be humble. May we always possess an attitude that says, Jesus Christ has given me what I do not deserve and could never earn, and he can give that to anyone in this room as well. Because I'm not that great. Trust me, I'm not that great. You can ask my kids. As a matter of fact, don't talk to my kids. I don't want you to. No. <laughs> I'm not that great. And everybody else is not that bad. But we are, none of us are good according to God's standards. And we all need the salvation that only belief and faith in Jesus Christ can give to us. For some of you who have made that commitment already, I wonder, is, is Jesus Christ just good? Or does he have permission to be God in your life? Because he's not going to just take it. We have to make that decision of, Jesus, if you said it, I'm going to live by it. If you tell me this is how you want me to operate in my marriage, that's how it's going to go. If this is how I'm supposed to parent, if this is what you want me to do financially, if this is how I'm supposed to behave with my boss, if this is how I'm supposed to pray for people who are not on the same page with me, if these are the words I should use with people who are of a different political party than I am, Jesus, oh, I got, oh, yeah, we're going to get personal because I've been watching some of your Facebook posts. Matter of fact, I got a couple of my, like, no, I'm just kidding. I wouldn't do that. Some of those aren't appropriate at church. But, Lord, may I respond in a way, may I talk in a way, when I behave in a way that proves and demonstrates that you have authority in my life. And maybe for some of us today, it's getting to that spot of what is your one thing God, what is the one thing that he's asking you to say? Will you let this go to follow him with everything that you've got? I don't know what that would be. For some of us, it might be wealth. It could be a whole host of things. But making that decision today to say, God, if this is what you ask of me, because I don't want to get to the end of my life with my face hanging low with sadness because I said I didn't give it up what Jesus was asking for. 
and miss the opportunity of my entire life to follow him, to do, see him do incredible things in and through my life. I don't want you to miss that either. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. I thank you that even as we read this scripture, Jesus, you looked at this man and it wasn't in condemnation. It says that you looked at him and you loved him. And God, I know you love each and every one of us. You love us so much that you would send your son, Jesus, to pay the penalty for our sins. And so right now, God, I pray that there are probably many of us in this room that there is something holding us back. I don't know what that may be. Maybe it's our comfort control. Maybe it's a relationship. Whatever that may be, Lord, I pray that you would be speaking personally to each and every one of us about what that is. And yet, we have to make that decision. Are we going to follow you? Are we going to trust you? Are we going to do what you ask? Or, or will we walk away? I pray for some of us that today would be Today would be a decision that is made in a a step of following you no matter what. Father, for some of us in here who we love to claim that you are good, but maybe it's not, not to the point of saying that you are God in our lives, that you have control, that we are being obedient to you. And Lord, I pray for each and every one of us who has come to that place where we have received what you have done for us in grace, that we realize we can never earn favor with you, that we can only receive your forgiveness. But would you always keep us humble? Would we realize that compared to you, we pale in comparison, and that we would have grace for those who have yet to find and discover a relationship with you like we have? And if you're here this morning and right now, maybe for the very first time, if the question was brought up, how can you inherit eternal life? You've been trying to earn it. You've been trying to work really hard or maybe, maybe honestly, you just haven't had a clue. But today you know that Jesus Christ paid the price for you. And today is a day that will forever change your life. And he's asking you, are you just going to receive? Will you believe and receive? And if that's you right now and you say, I'm ready to take that step, can I encourage you maybe to say a simple prayer like this in your heart? God, I need you in my life. I need you. And I realize I can never earn my relationship with you. So Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for my sin. And I ask you to come into my life. Give me a brand new start. Forgive me. And help me to walk in obedience to you for the rest of my days. Not just being good to me, but being my God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.